current form of money that we have today is obsolete. We've been using the same system for, for centuries. What we need is a new form of money that is fit for the future. We believe the blockchain technology is the future of finance, bringing trust and transparency to any transaction. In payments, its programmability allows banks and payment firms to innovate for their customers. While in capital markets, tokenization of all kinds of asset classes is connecting issuers to deep pools of entirely new investors. The impact of blockchain to finance is actually just as big as the impact of the internet to society. It really is transformative and changing the entire underlying architecture and the infrastructure of what we use today. Blockchain allows us to have smart money. Smart money allows us to program new types of logic, new types of functionality into money to do things that is really fit for purpose for the 21st century. But there's a problem. Blockchain is often costly and complex to implement properly. And most enterprises lack the specialist knowledge required. Each of the blockchain technologies is really complicated and it's quite a niche skill, right? They were only invented a few years ago. There's not millions of developers that know this. It's a new nascent technology that's hugely transformative, but difficult to integrate and difficult to bring into any financial institution. Its usefulness is undermined by a lack of common standards, the inability of assets deployed on one blockchain to run on another, and the fact that bridges between networks and poorly written smart contracts can be exploited. I founded Quant with the vision of really changing the entire architecture of our financial system. The pain points that everyone faced with blockchain technology was a barrier to its adoption. And so we set out very early on to remove all the friction, change all the perceptions of blockchain and make it easy to integrate into any corporate or enterprise system. Until now, we've been applying our expertise in standards, interoperability and secure smart contracts to a few transformational projects. We've worked on national infrastructure in Italy, a cross-border payments network in Latin America, and most recently on Project Rosalind. Project Rosalind is our collaboration with the Bank of England and the Bank of International Settlement to understand and test with the industry what a retail central bank digital currency looks like. On the infrastructure side, we hosted the blockchain, we built the smart contracts, we expose smart contracts to a kind of a back-end API, so this is the technical work. And we're also involved in kind of building the requirements, right? So we spent a lot of time in workshops with all of the other folks in the project, building out how should this work. So there's a lot of detail in that. So in terms of participation, we put a lot of expertise into the project, we put a lot of experience into the project, and then we did all the technical work as well. What we learned was there's a way we can make money, a digital pound, for example, smart. We saw firsthand Participants like the Central Bank of Canada, Amazon, Barclays, MasterCard use this innovative escrow technology that we built to create new types of payments and new types of flows. We're proud to announce that the same interoperable technology, the same expertise in blockchain and secure smart contracts, the same commitment to security and resilience that has underpinned all of our work to date is now available to anyone with the launch of Overledger platform. We're launching Overledger platform as the enterprise standard for building on blockchain. We've taken all the experience and work that we've done for the Bank of England, Bank of International Settlement, and opened that up for the rest of the industry to use. By using Overledger between their technology and the blockchains, They've got a standardized API layer that translates all of the messages that are needed, which means that people can build faster, they can build more securely, they can build without hiring external developers, they can use their existing in-house developers. And not only that, they can connect their existing technologies. So rather than building a whole new platform, take the platform you've got and build a blockchain module for it using Overledger. You could get to market three, six, nine times faster, depending on your use case. Blockchain projects need this kind of technology. It makes the projects faster, it makes them cheaper, and it makes them last a lot longer once they're built. So Overledger platform is just a massive enabler. Overledger is a game changer because it allows people to connect to blockchains without knowing anything about them. We have all of our APIs in a business language, so you don't have to have any expertise in blockchain to be able to connect to them. It just makes it super easy and super simple. 
it's our way of creating mass adoption of the technology. It's an enterprise way to access this new innovative technology without having all the friction and the barriers and the challenges that come with it. Overledger platform is simple, trusted and future-proof. It's available today from our website. Hello everybody, it's Max with Crypto Talk now. In today's Q&T video, we're going to get into this big quant network update, but if anything, it's going to break down a few key things that we should all pay attention to. So for one, let's start things off with this. Following institutional money, there is a narrative that I believe, and I think a lot of people believe, has shifted, right? As the saying goes, if you can't beat them, join them. Here's an example. So it says the slate of spot Bitcoin ETF application announcements by larger institutions, in this case, BlackRock, has definitely brought back bullishness into crypto markets. Yes, absolutely. You know, when I see things like this from, you know, Watcher Guru, you know, posted yesterday, by the time you guys get this, it might be the next day. But, you know, Fed Chair Jerome Powell says crypto appears to have staying power as an asset class. That is the shift. Again, if you can't beat them, join them. There's a lot of things that's been happening recently, you know, when it comes to crypto, whether it's the SEC attacking all of crypto in itself. You see a big pullback. We basically almost went down into the billions instead of one trillion even for the overall crypto market it makes you wonder like is this the last chance for accumulation not only for retail such as us but what about for institutions so you know uh there was this of course in it obviously shout out to greg lunt and other um content creators out there that are also reporting some of this but it says q t has officially released the overledger platform to the public now before in the past when People asked, hey, do you have anything in regards to Quant uh, Network and a demo of Overledger? We only had a little brief little um, demo that showed a, a few key things. And they were impressive. Don't get me wrong. You know, being able to see Overledger switch to um, the XRPL and settle um, RTGS, for instance, in, um, you know, XRP. That That's amazing stuff. But, you know, from the video you saw... There are some things I want to basically break down for you, and we're going to pause in some key areas in regards to that uh, here in a bit. Now, what I want to state is this, okay, before we get into all this, and that basically is this. With, for instance, meme coins, you know, a lot of times um, Quant took some harsh criticism, right? And I don't think it's rightfully so, right? You know, talking about this ERC-20 token. Let's get into the subject just briefly before we move on about it being an ERC-20 token. So much more than ERC-20 token, right? But there is, a, of course, a narrative of people out there that think, you know, well, yeah, it basically is that. No, it's not. You know, their focus is not on retail, like it was mentioned before from Gilbert Verde and so on. You know, Quant's focus is basically just that, blockchain agnostic through the likes of the overledger operating system, right? Blockchain agnostic, allows for interoperability, 100 plus blockchains, so many impressive things like what was mentioned here recently with APIs. But you know, Greg Lunt reported this and he states, following this week's groundbreaking partnership with the Bank of International Settlements, which was huge news in itself, Quant Network has now made their technology available to the rest of the industry. But my key thing is the industry as in the you know, institutional industries of the world, like the Black Rocks and so on. You know, that's what excites me when I think of, you know, a utility run that's never happened in the history of crypto yet. Key thing here is yet, right? We could talk about these four year um, cycles and, a you know, a fourth boom cycle. There's money obviously to be made, but when I want to talk about the generational wealth, it has to start with. You know, getting to the point where the institutional money is coming in. So, are we seeing hints of all that? That's the bottom line, right? So, Gray posted this, and he says Overledger gives enterprise uh, enterprises a standardized API layer to connect existing technology stacks to blockchain. 
This allows, of course, for things that we know, interoperability, scalability, enterprise-grade resilience, right? Most importantly, Overledger allows developers to create multi-chain, multi-network smart contracts without any prior blockchain knowledge. You know, if you could create something where devs want to come over to your platform and they don't have to, you know, uh, learn a whole bunch of different coding and so on, you know, like I've always used this example in the past, you know, you might have a dev that only knows Python. You might have a dev that only knows C Sharp. You may have a dev that only knows, you know, C++ and they don't, you know, know all these other particular coding languages and so on. If you could create something like an operating system to get it all done, like Gilbert Verde mentioned with three lines of code, that's a very, very attractive because when we talk about blockchain projects that want to build out their ecosystems and so on, Think about, you know, what Gilbert mentioned, walled gardens. To a sense, that's a version of a walled garden setting up barriers. No, the opposite of this, right? So this simple, trusted, future-proof technology is how mass adoption Web3 is truly achieved. If you were excited in the past about three trillion overall crypto market cap uh, back in you know November of 2021 when BTC was at 69k, what about the institutional money? Right, we talk about BlackRock ETF and so on, five trillion, ten trillion, maybe fifteen trillion that could be added to the overall crypto market. Well. If we're going to have institutional money coming in, they need to have a platform, for, you know, the on ramping, if you will, right? APIs, you name it, right? You have to have something. Well, if we were excited about Microsoft and in the past and so on, um, giving ease of access of pers you know, to personal computers and businesses and so on, what about when it comes to Web3, blockchain and so on? Is Quants over Leisure the basic example? I think it is but before we jump into this i want to show you guys something that you know you're probably very very aware of and that is when we talk about the topic of erc20 tokens and so on and how easily they are able to be deployed well you're going to see this brief video here on how easy it is to set up a meme coin and you may think well what the heck does this have to do with quant network the point i'm going to show you guys is basically here in this video because if the average Joe Schmo can easily make a meme token in about 27 seconds, well, how about making things readily available for the on-ramping for the institutional players to come into the mix with the likes of Overleisure? Check this out. Here we go. So here's the point I'm trying to make, right? You know, if it's so easy to create those garbage meme tokens, let's just be honest about it. And I'm guilty about, you know, getting some of those in the past and so on. But my days of chasing some of these, the, the next pump and dump are over with. For the same reason that institutional money cannot come in without that clarity. But you better believe that with the shift going on here a new narrative and so on the institutional money is going to look upon the ones that are going to help them give them the tools for that on ramping once over leisure in my opinion is the answer to that basic question is there a solution you better believe it so we're gonna play a little bit of this again um not so much to the point where we play the whole thing, but there's some key things that I really, really like that was mentioned here. Um, so we're gonna actually just play this in this window. And my thing is this, you know, I took some notes and I said to myself, let's go into this just for a brief bit. So let's go ahead and play this. 
current form of money that we have today is obsolete. We've been using the same system for, for centuries. What we need is a new form of money that is fit for the future. Think about what he mentioned right there, right? I mean, this is good stuff. I mean, this is tremendous. So, you know, he talks about this concept of the current money being obsolete. How is the current money obsolete? Well, there's many, many reasons about that, right? So, you know, look what's mentioned here. As people move toward more electronic or digital forms of payment, it may seem like paper money is on its way towards uh, basically being obsolete. But experts say that cash will always be around. Well, here's the thing. And I've used it, of course, in the Jasmine example and so on, with Japan, data free flow with trust and so on. You know, there's one thing to have, for instance, in the United States, 2% crypto adoption. It's been about the same, you know, for the last couple of years, but there is a shift that's starting to happen, right? Is it the institutional shift? If retail is still stuck here in the United States at a 2% adoption rate, how do we ever get to the point where we have what? Full scale, widespread adoption. I think it's just that that on ramping of traditional finance to crypto As the saying goes if your grandmother or your aunt or whoever can swipe their debit card right and not even realize it's tied into blockchain distributed ledgers technologies and so on that is absolutely massive because we understand at some point that yes the current money is going to become obsolete because you're going to have a digital form on it you know the tokenization of anything and everything i think at one point or another we're going to see everything be tokenized it's just simply the way of the future with web3 now this is a reference in regards to um you know some of the things that were mentioned in the video and i actually i will jump back to, to a little bit more in that in, here in a bit but this is a reference from the bank of international settlements so of course that made recent news um in regards to uh, some verifications right uh you know in the past what was considered as, as ndas right being verifiable and so on uh, confirmed so it says basically the future monetary system will be adaptable allowing private sector innovation to flourish while avoiding the drawbacks of crypto right flourish innovation well if you know if innovation is to flourish we have to have you know good regulations not just nonsensical regulations um to allow this to do just that flourish right so it says you know this of course is going to help towards avoiding the drawbacks of i guess you could say current crypto as we know it um but a little bit more in regards to this it says you know they have this thing it states the vision of the future monetary system built on central bank public is the final section concludes you know what do we want from a monetary system you know we talk about for instance you know uh we're going into this new monetary system well what does that entail you know well the new monetary system is a set of institutions and arrangements that supports monetary exchange it consists of money and payment systems what is required from such a system to serve society great question um basically you know there is no uh, canonical list of necessary features but the number of high level goals stand out here and basically it's a lot of references to what you hear not only Martin Hargreaves talk about but what Gilbert Verdian has mentioned and that is you have to ensure safety and stability you have to have for instance um, some of these three main functions it has to be accountable it has to be efficient uh, there has to be financial in inclusion there has to be you know, one more right or a couple more user control integrity all these things have been outlined for instance in um sap right in the past and so on and you know why is that crucial right well my thing is once you understand some of the things that we've been following in the past it gives you a broader sense of why it mentioned or uh, why it stands out so much right now so a little bit more in regards to this um we're going to jump back to this video and you know basically it's right here again and you know i took a little bit more notes but let's play this here we go we believe 
The blockchain technology is the future of finance, bringing trust and transparency to any transaction. In payments, its programmability allows banks and payment firms to innovate for their customers. While in capital markets, tokenization of all kinds of asset classes is connecting issuers to deep pools of entirely new investors. The impact of blockchain to finance is actually just as big as the impact of the internet to society. It really is transformative and changing the entire underlying architecture and the infrastructure of what we use today. Blockchain allows us to have smart money. Smart money allows us to program new types of logic, new types of functionality into money to do things that is really fit for purpose for the 21st century. Right, you know, we talk about this whole concept of Web3, you name it and so on, you know. So some of the notes I took basically is like, you know, this new money fit for the future. You know, blockchain, like you, you mentioned uh, later in the video, like I play it all, um, you know, is costly and complex. It is. Blockchain is undermined by a lack of common standards. What about some of these key common standards? You know, that's a great question. You know, my thing is this. You know, I want to bring you guys to a little bit more of why we take some of these deeper dives. You know, that's something that we do here at CTN. And basically speaking, it's recognizing um, why we should pay attention to all this. So on June 20th, while there was a lot of coverage about the Bank of International Settlements and so on, and that was huge, massive news. I didn't have a chance to do an update at the time, but there's so many different outlets out there that were you know, giving you guys the news on it was just like a little late on that, unfortunately. But I thought I would at least take advantage of getting this out to you guys in regards to this particular update. So um, I believe currently speaking, it is now the 23rd. This was reported on the 20th, bringing APIs to life with webhooks. Now, for instance, with Ripple's XRP, there's always the mention of, you know, hooks. For instance, this is a different type of thing. What about from quant, right? That's the bottom line. Um, I like this, you know, it, it gives you some explanations, education behind it, but it says the financial services industry is constantly evolving. It is. And one of the most significant developments is the integration of blockchain tech, right? One way to integrate blockchain into financial services is by using APIs and webhooks. Now in that video, the intro video, or the one that we kind of, you know, pause in here, um, gets into some of the key things here, right? It says, what are webhooks? And basically speaking, why is Quant, you know, enabling them? That's a great question. Well, it says, we are dedicating to making blockchain tech simple, trusted, and future-proof. How many times have you heard Gilbert Verdian over the last few years mention some of these things? Over and over, countless different interviews. He's going to continue to mention even long after I do this video, that's for sure. But it says, this means making their technology accessible, reliable, and adaptable for anyone building onto it. To achieve this, they are introducing new APIs that can enhance automation, provide valuable insights, and increase efficiency for their users and basically their projects. Um, this is referred to as Overledger's V3 API, um, you know, webhook APIs, I guess you could say, like their own version of it. Essentially, a webhook is an automatic notification to an application when it, an interesting event occurs, right? So I'm going to show you guys here a brief example. Um, I fast forward it to this and, and why we should pay attention to this because, you know, it's like this. When we talk about, for instance, you know, institutional money coming in and, for instance, you know, whether it is, a, you know, like a BlackRock or, you know, Fidelity or you name it, right? Um they're using over a ledger, okay? And with that said, you know, how does something like a webhook, you know, trigger an event in which uh, is going to allow them to kind of have an understanding of why that's so significant, right? So I'm going to play this for just a brief moment. I'm not going to get into all of it, but check this out for yourself. Here we go. Tyke uses webhooks in order to send relevant event information to applications. For example, in this case, I have set a rate limit for a user, and if that user hits five times a request in less than 10 seconds, an event is going to be triggered. So if I click five times, I'm going to see how an event pops up on the webhook endpoint. Here, the event is going to be named rate limiting exceeds, 
and I need to know who exactly is reaching that limit with the key. All right. Even though it seems like a nerdy thing to look at, it's such a basic thing to try to understand, right? I could explain it, but you got to get sometimes like a visual about it, right? So I thought I would share that with you guys. Um, and on top of that, here's something I really wanted to uh, reference in regards to uh, our outline tonight. Um, so basically speaking, there is this guy from a while back, uh, Dr. Royal F uh, Roy Fielding. In his doctoral dis dissertation, he talks about this thing called REST, and it basically is referred to as RESTful APIs. Now, this is crucial because in the past, people have stated, you know, um, IBM will never use quant, right? Will never use quant network, which is just absolutely ridiculous when you think about it, right? But what about quant using IPM, uh, IBM's uh, technologies of the past to you know, flourish, you know, we talked about the whole thing and the concept of this whole thing flourishing, right? So one thing I love about watching some of these old interviews from Gilbert Verdian talking about some of the use cases of the Overledger network, um, you know, the platform spe specifically, I think even Martin Hargreaves talked about a little bit too, is basically the terminology of some of the things that they mentioned, okay? So first defined in the year 2000 listen to this by computer scientist dr royal fielding in his doctoral dissertation rest as in restful apis provides a relatively high level of flexibility and freedom for developers now think about this for a second if you're allowing freedom for developers you have to have freedom for new developers to come into what? Quant's overledger operating system platform and so on, right? This flexibility is just one reason why REST APIs have emerged as a common method for connecting components and applications in microservices architecture. The blueprint was literally placed down many years ago. And in my opinion, and I think this is going to be proof, they're going to, this is going to show you guys that they implemented some of this tech, if you will, from Dr. Roy Fielding from IBM into Quant's Overledger. So if anything, let's jump into this right now. I'm going to pause on some key things that you may not have even been aware of. Um, like it says, you know, why is RESTful API so popular? Look, it goes from the client. REST API to the server. I know it's just some kind of nerdish stuff here, but um, nonetheless, here is the interview. Roy T. Fielding, understand the REST style. I'm going to have to fast forward this a little bit, but when you hear him talk specifically about some of this stuff, it's like, oh, wow. You know, Gilbert Verdian, Martin Hargreaves, they also mentioned some of these specific things. It's awesome. Check this out, this particular interview, understanding the REST style. Here we go. The REST architectural style started as a model of how the web should work, how really how web applications should work in the sense that um, we had in the early 90s, back in 1993, 94, uh, we had a pretty good deployed system, the World Wide Web. Um, we had uh, clients and servers, user agents, browsers, whatever you want to call them. Um, and um, simple servers, primarily serving up files and a few database systems. And we had this desire to, um, once there are more than a few uh, implementations of the web protocols, we wanted to standardize those protocols. Um, as that right there. I mean, come on. Standardize web protocols. What was mentioned in the video that you saw from Gilbert Verdian? right you know creating um standards right there's more than one standard obviously but i mean the terminology just kind of matches up we'll play a little bit more as part of the w3c and as part of the, the ietf um, and in general just to resolve some of the disagreements amongst the developers at the time most of the web was built um informally using um a mailing list primarily as our coordination mechanism we talked all around the world about a new feature and frequently we would come up with an idea in one time zone and someone would implement it in another time zone and by the next morning you'd know what worked what didn't work with that feature. So it was very free form, very fast. As the companies got involved they of course wanted to find 
ways to uh, make uses of, use of the web corporately um, to make it as one of their platforms. And so they use web corporately, use it as one of their platforms. Again, you know, yes, a platform where we can on ramp institutional money. Do you not feel bullish on this already? I do. Let's play more. They wanted to make it more businessy. And one of the ways to make things more businessy is to create common standards for everyone to adhere to rather than adopt things as you go along. Um, and uh, as one of the developers of a protocol library for the web called liveww-pearl, and that's the last time I used www in, in a product name because it's too hard to say. Um, the, uh, I was asked to help work on the standards, um, both the uh, URL standard at the time, the HTML standard, and later on the HTTP standard. Um, because I was a graduate student at UC Irvine, I had all the freedom in the world. I hadn't started working on my dissertation yet, and um, but I'd finished all my classwork. And that gave me both the freedom and the ability to write for the web, in addition to the programming that I was still doing. And it just worked out that um, being in that position was great. And that I, I could have a hand at, at um, making the web better because at the time it had grown out in every direction at once. And, but at the same time, I was faced with the dilemma of I have many competing interests working towards making the web what they think is a better place. And how do I differentiate between the ones that are actually better for the web and the ones that are back to some older version of an architecture or an architecture that doesn't make any sense at all on the, on the internet? Um, and so I came up with something called the HTTP object model. At the time, object models were the thing. So that's why I called it an object model. Even though it had nothing to do with objects, um, it was still it was a model of, of how I expected web applications to behave. And uh, the team that was working on the, the specification, mostly myself and, and uh, Henrik Fristick Nielsen at the W3C, uh, we were asked to write the HTTP standard. And this was my model of describing um, to each other, basically, how uh, a particular change to the standard would, would affect the resulting web. Because the web itself is, is really a network of standards. Do you notice the key common underlying factor when it comes to all this? For me personally, when you see interviews of Gilbert Verde and talking about the history of like Web 1, you know, Web 2, where we're trying to get to Web 3 and so on, it's like these guys are literally all pioneers of, you know, the internet, right? You know, Gilbert Verde and the ties to the IETF. This particular guy, right, Dr. Uh, Roy T. Fielding and so on. It's amazing that you can totally see the breakdown many years ago of how some of these big industri uh, industry players, whether it is Gilbert Verdian or and some of these other guys, um, had a firm understanding of the foundational moments of going from Web 1 to Web 2, like what you saw right here back in the, you know, um, I guess you could say in 2000, I mean, obviously many years after that, we finally saw, you know, Web 2. Um, but the key thing is, you know, like what he's mentioning here. I mean, I just think it's just, it's amazing. We connect some of the dots, if you will, um, and, and IBM, right? You know, some people criticize IBM stating that, you know, they're not doing enough in the modern age, to say the least, right? They definitely are doing enough, um, just, you know, in my opinion. And, you know, whether it's Casper, Excuse me. Um, whether it's you know the being a you know excuse me with Hedera, uh, with the governing council, obviously you know what they got going on with QNT. It's amazing stuff. We're gonna play a little bit more in regards to this. Here we go. And uh, I use that throughout the years just as a uh, basically a thought description. If someone would offer a feature or describe something that they thought was wrong with the web. I would use the the model as as a um, sort of an analogy or or a proof point to show 
what it is about HCP that works at that model and what it is that the new feature might hurt or might help. Um, and that allowed me to some intellectual leverage in, in many ways to, uh, to affect how the HCP standard worked. It wasn't until um, many years later, after I'd done the literature search for software architecture, that I figured out uh, the right words to use to describe it. I saw a paper by uh, uh, Dwayne Perry and uh, Alex Wolf um, in the software engineering, one of the software engineering papers. It was a very, buried in, in one of the um, ACM SIGSOFT proceedings which are distributed very far beyond your, your school library and things like that. Um, but I found this paper and it was the only software architecture paper that described architecture in terms of um, both the components and connectors of typical architecture diagrams, but also the data that's processed through the system. And my realization is that all these architecture papers which I had read, which didn't make any sense to me, because they are all talking about the blueprints of an architecture. And this paper was talking about the actual runtime architecture, the actual behavior of the system, and that's what I was building. It sounds like you were flowing between a very practical and pragmatic world and this kind of theoretical world, and just flowing gently back and forth for some period of time and like picking up on both sides. Exactly. I mean, one of the the great benefits I had at UCI was all the, the freedom to pursue these different areas. I was actually working in um, a team uh, doing research on global software engineering environments. So I was trying to use the web as a platform for software engineering, essentially what GitHub is today. That was my research project. And as part of that, I could do all of this other work um, related to it. Um, one of the nice things about general research funding at the time. So at some point you had to sort of like take a breath and finish a thesis. Yeah, I, I came from an academic background. My father's a professor of geography and urban economics. And uh, so I always wanted to, to complete the PhD. It, it was never a question of, of running off and joining a startup, even though my startup friends were becoming millionaires left and right. Um, there was that, always that desire to finish the PhD. Was it easy to write? Did it come naturally at that point? Had you, I mean, was it the idea fully in your mind at that point? Uh, oh yeah, the, the idea was, was not only fully in my mind, but almost past at that point. It was, it was long, because I finished the HTTP, finished the HTTP standard in, in um, 1997. And it wasn't until I had done the work that actually a colleague of mine, Larry Macinter, came um, and was talking to me about a related subject and, and I was telling him about how, you know, I've, you know I've, I've done all this work, I don't know what to do for my dissertation, and he just looked at me and said, well, you're the only one who can describe HCP, why it's there and what, what it's there for, why don't you just do that? And so that gave me the impetus to actually, well, I can do this, I can describe what I already did, I can actually describe it. But then the question was, I've been just fooling around in my, you know, in that, that wasn't my academic work. My academic work was over here, and my practical work was on, on, on the web, and I hadn't really mixed the two other than general knowledge. And um, for me, uh, going back and trying to, to find the real um, knowledge framework for architectural styles uh, was my way of uh, fitting it all together. What's it like to be the creator of a dissertation that someone actually reads? It, it, it's, it's funny because when I was a graduate student, one of the, the main motivators that the professors would have, they'd very seriously look at us as, don't worry about what you put in dissertation, nobody's going to read it anyways. I might because I'm on your, on your committee, but, but don't, you know, don't worry about it because no one outside your committee is ever going to read this thing, just get it done, go on. Um, it's, it's just not my style to, to do that kind of writing. So I, I considered my first book, my only book really. And for me, writing is very difficult in the sense that I spend a lot of time thinking about each sentence, each paragraph. Um, I'm not the kind of person who writes down a quick rough draft and then goes through and edits it again. I, I tend to edit 
sentence by paragraph, then add a paragraph, then delete two paragraphs, and then go back and, and you know, that kind of thing. Um, so it, it's gratifying that people like to read a dissertation. Um, part of the, it's certainly an accessible piece of work. It's not, not full of equations. There's one equation. It, the, the equation is there just to have an equation, by the way. It's, um, it's not actually necessary, but it's nice to have one. It's rare that academic research has the profound impact, and honestly, the freedom that you had is what it, everyone should have. Exactly. Yeah, what the, freedom, the freedom gave me the ability to do technology transfer beyond their wildest imagination, which is great. It, what's hilarious from my standpoint is I was just having fun. Um, I was trying to do a good for, you know, my good deed for the universe kind of thing, but, um, and it was all for free, basically. Uh, but it was, for me, fun. Enjoyable people, wonderful conversations, uh, learn an incredible amount. All right, I know I play a little bit, you know, extensive there, but I mean, it's just, it's great to see some of these interviews, at least it is in my opinion. Um, you know, this guy does for fun. He, you know, is a pioneer. You know, we talk about, for instance, and I'll come back in the frame, um, you know, Gilbert Verdian and, you know, the whole concept of the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force. I mean, add another notch in the belt of some of these guys that you could add to that. He, yes, he's not officially part of the Internet Engineering Task Force, but everything was mentioned in regards to the architecture and, uh, you know, some of the things that he was researching all the way back, you know, back to 1992. So I want to show you guys a little bit more of what we have um, you know, it, things like this, right? You know, think about this time that, you know, people were saying that, uh, everything with Q and T is just speculative and so on. So how about this? This is from three years ago and it's from Reddit. This guy, he states, I highly doubt, listen to this. This is unbelievable. I highly doubt IBM will ever use quant. Unbelievable. Especially when you consider that they already use stellar for their settlement protocol. All right, think about this for a second. They're also big contributors to Hyperledger and loosely tied to the Polkadot network, right? Well, okay. And then, you know, how about this? You know, remember the Nexi partnership? Have people forgotten about this? Well, I think a lot of us haven't, but, you know, if you're new, it's okay. You know, I'm not criticizing. We're all new at some point. But, you know, this comes straight from the Nexi IBM PDF. And more than ever, it pounds home why we, you know, take some of the extensive deep dives. We had the blast from the past of, you know, you know, connecting things from the past to what's happening here in the present and so on. Or me taking this interview from this particular uh, person uh, who greatly contributed to some of the things that we just aren't even aware of in regards to HTTP and so on, right? So yes, Nexi selected IBM to modernize core payment systems. And, you know, when we talk about, you know, Quant's overleisure being like literally like the on-ramp to get a lot of these things done, well, it's just like, okay, this is a perfect example. So, I mean, this was back in January 17th of 2023, but, you know, it states the Paytech to upgrade core infrastructure to IBM Z16, providing more secure, reliable, and quantum safe transaction processing for cl uh, clients while reducing its energy consumption. At least that was back then. There's more about it, you know, here and so on. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Customer demand for digital banking services, you know, just like we were talking about earlier or showing you guys at the very beginning of this video with that intro, um, rapidly increasing as regulatory and compliance requirements evolve. Think about what we were talking about earlier, you know, the black rocks of the world, you know, you have the whole thing with the ETF. Um, we're moving closer to a cashless society. Some of the key things that Gilbert Verdian was mentioned again in that video. Nexi is responding by modernizing its technology to help elevate customer experience um, across its expanding client base that includes more than 1,000 financial institutions. So my thing is, you know, man, you know, we're seeing a lot of momentum here recently. But again, in the past, some people didn't feel as though that was the case. And here's a perfect example of, yes, there, there was that case. But, you know, we, it just it takes the building phase to get things done. 
again, 1,000 financial institutions and more than 2 million merchants. Nexi, together with his partners, partner banks, manages 170 million payment cards and 29 billion acquiring and transactions across Europe. There's, of course, met, you know, a lot more info in regards to this PDF. Um, but I just want to mention this real quick, just to pound it home a little bit more in regards to Nexi. This is straight from the Quant Network. SIA, a well-known high-tech Italian company, is now part of Nexi Group. Okay, and this was originally reported, I believe, a while back, like maybe a couple years ago. Um, yeah, like it says, you know, now part of Nexi Group, it provides innovation solutions for the banking and finance sectors. You know, think about everything that's just been recently confirmed in regards to the banking international settlements and so on. It's pretty big stuff. So we have entered into an agreement with the goal of integrating the SIA chain infrastructure with Quants Overledger to develop DLT-based cross-platform applications and services. The partnerships will help SIA create a fully interoperable blockchain network. So again, guys, I mean, I know I got um, went more into detail about some of these things, but my thing is this. This is you know the perfect example if you can't beat them join them you're literally seeing a narrative shift completely and you know for me personally it's like when we talk about you know um regulatory clarity and you know like i always mention especially with the jasmine videos um dfft data free flow with trust that regulatory framework that's going to lead to the clarity and so on to try to get the you know institutionals on board well, what about giving the big institutional players a platform through the likes of overledger for that on ramping whether it is apis whether it is some of these other things for the payment rails and so on it's pretty awesome to see what quant is basically doing and just because, you know, again, like I said before, you don't see a lot of news in the future. I think all of us should treat it as they're building, they're doing something, or they're expanding. So glad to give you guys this Q&T update. Like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't done so already. And if anything, all these guys you see on crypto Twitter was Greg Lunt, Quant Papa, welcome back, by the way, um, Tokenizer, San NL, probably a whole bunch of other, you know, key researchers tokenizer i think i already mentioned them um that bring you guys consistent updates and connect the dots and been doing it for the longest time you deserve a follow right absolutely thanks again so much for watching like comment subscribe like i mentioned before and hit that bell notification you appreciate these type of videos and the content that we bring you guys if you want to see a live show where we talk about some of these use cases for various different dlts and so on check us out every single day at 9 p.m. Eastern and 6 p.m. Pacific for Crypto Talk Now. Thanks again for watching. We will see you on the next one.